is the Soul Side Up. I'm your host, Soon. Welcome to an hour of beautiful conversation. Open your heart and enjoy. Hi, everyone. This is Soon, and I'm back with another episode of Soul Side Up. Today, I have my friend and colleague Eric Myers with me to discuss his new book. The Beatles, it's probably, yeah, it's a massive one. It's, it's a good read and it's very comfortable actually to have in your lap while you're reading. Hi, Eric, how are you doing? Hi, so I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, thank you for, for you know, sharing this magnificent book with me. I was quite surprised when I saw how enormous the material was and how well written it was. So Congratulations. Well, thank you for, for contributing an endorsement that's in the book. So I appreciate your support with that. Yeah, well, it was one of those magical synchronicities because while you were writing the book, my son just got so deep into the Beatles. He was like Beatles all over. So I've been listening to Beatles for like a couple of years now. Hey, mom, you got to listen to this one. Hey, have you heard that one? Oh, this is really cool. And then he started go. You know, he really advanced quickly and he started going into, you know, the little uh, solo careers they all had. And suddenly he was listening to George Harrison. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Wow. The Beatles, they're still alive in a way. They're vibrant. My, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Well, they'll be immortal forever. <laughs> in fact, one of the last things I write in the book is um, as I'm closing it, I say, that for as long as there's life on this planet, the music of the Beatles is likely to be appreciated. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I grew up with the Beatles myself, but I, I was no way as nerdy into the material as you've been evidently, but it's been part of my upbringing for sure. Yeah. Well, I would say that I wasn't as nerdy until I began this book project and then I got extremely nerdy. Oh, really? But it has been a lifelong passion. I did get into them when I was about four or five years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about it. You know, I guess we belong to that generation who had parents who actively listened to the Beatles. You know, at least that's where... Yeah, well, I was born right when they were breaking up and my parents you know, had Beatles albums, you know, when I was born. And so mm -hmm. I just listened to them as a little kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, when did you start writing this book? Because it's quite big and there's a lot of research and, and energy and effort that goes into it. I mean, it's really massive in terms of uh, details and background. And it seems like you have a really good grip on the history of the Beatles in general. Yeah, well, I, like I said, I, I got pretty obsessed with the material. And so I began writing it right at the end of 2016, as it was turning to 2017. Mm. And then I spent four and a half years, you know, really immersed in the subject matter. And so I did read somewhere between 25 and 35 books on the Beatles during this time to get really educated on everything. So uh, I had that background. So when I looked at all the astrology and I did all my research, I had a lot of the context, a lot of the background. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just exploring the music um, as I was researching and writing, listened to it constantly. And, uh, and it just was a really enjoyable creative process that, you know, went very deep for a few years hmm. and so yeah the book is quite thorough there's a lot of info um i wanted to do it justice if i was going to get deep into this material i wanted it to be substantial hmm. so it might be a lot for some people but you know and i i've been reading all these other beatles books which many of them are much bigger than this book, actually. There's a lot of Beatles books that are a thousand pages or more mm. because it's so rich. There's a lot to say. Mm. Oh, definitely. You know, like I think what I, um, what I think is so magnificent with the book is that, you know, I, 
I couldn't help thinking that every Beatles should read this one. And I felt really sorry that John didn't get it. You know, like I was a big John Lennon fan. And, you know, there's still something with him. And I think he would have appreciated having this one because apart from other Beatles books, not that I'm a connoisseur, uh, I would think when they lack the astrological dimension, it sort of becomes sort of like, and then they did this and then they did that, you know, with the astrology, it's certain. It certainly makes them come alive in a way that I wasn't prepared for. You know, I saw something in each and every beetle, something that I could recognize immediately when you describe it, but I had never thought of it in astrological terms in the way that you can so eloquently put it into words. Yeah, well, that's the whole point of motivation of the book and that's the title the spiritual dimension of the Beatles, mm. which is not what you see in more everyday biographical accounts you just get the story you don't have the overarching context mm. at a soul level so that's why i wrote the book is to provide that and so as i say in the intro this isn't to replace the well-known facts it just gives another layer of the proverbial onion about what's going on to complement our familiar understandings, just having this other perspective at the soul level, what was really going on. Yeah. Another point that I thought was extremely interesting and that's, you know, absolutely um, worth mentioning is that it's, it's a historical document. You know, I read, I read Tarnas, uh, Richard Tarnas, Cosmos and Psyche, for instance, and he goes into the cycles of Pluto and Uranus in the late 60s and this is where the Beatles start or at least they start their ascending phase as you describe it in your book where they're kind of like in this um, uh, you know almost grown up but still very young and, and you know wearing the same suits and, and trying to find their expression and then as these Uranus <clears throat> Pluto cycles peak they start going through some incredibly interesting developments that seems to be completely synchronistical with the astrological transits. I also had no idea yeah. that their whole career span over the entirety of Pluto in Scor no Neptune in Scorpio, which is also another way of framing it historically, because it's, it was a very interesting time. Yeah, well, that pretty much is the context of the book is what you just mentioned, the Uranus-Pluto conjunction and Neptune and Scorpio. Um, and they, to me, are the prime kind of expression or example of um, that astrology during that time, because they were so prolific and famous, and um, they just really um, give voice to it. And see where we could see it so clearly. So that just became the structure of the book, mainly the Uranus-Pluto conjunction, um, how that was applying, peaking, and then separating in the 60s, mm. paralleling their career. Mm. Uh, it just was so obvious and consistent and you know, paralleling that so perfectly. So that did become the centerpiece of the book. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I really, it, that for me was you know, kind of the best part in a way, you know, how you kind of follow this, the peaking of this cycle, because um, our cultural, you know, understanding is an expression is always changing. And the Beatles, they were just there when after this new conjunction of Pluto Uranus, which has been so instrumental for the time that we live in now as well you know we recently came out of a square and you know it's 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 a challenging uh, duo you know these two because they kind of break away with so much of what is familiar and known to us um and start you know projecting us into the unknown you know when it comes to social structures and you know all kinds of laws and regulations that we, what we normalize in our lives. So, you know, it was quite a re revolution, you know, happening at that time. And, and the Beatles were like at the crooks of it in so many ways. So, um, yeah, that really blew my mind. I, I hadn't thought of it. Of course, you know, we've heard so much about this exact kind of 
Pluto Uranus conjunction, especially being an evolutionary astrologer, we're kind of like, oh yeah, that's the biggies. We follow them. But you describe it so well, you know, how it's manifesting from its applying to its separating expression with how they went through this whole journey that is the Beatles. And it ended quite, well, they ended up being quite individualistic in their expression. Yeah, well, I break it down um, into four phases in the book. The personality expression, personality reconciliation, transcendence, and then individuation. And so they unfolded in that developmental uh, arc, and then their music and contribution became um, consistent and an expression of that. And so it just takes you through this whole process of spiritual maturation mm. in almost this condensed way. The whole thing was only really a few years, but they had these four stages um, that is remarkable. The amount of maturation that unfolded over a relatively short period of time. I mean, one of the things I mentioned in the book is if you think of uh, the transcendence phase, Revolver opened that in 1966, and they're singing Tomorrow Never Knows, uh, George's song Love You Too, and even a few others on that album are so much more spiritually mature and significant and visionary. And you look at that album, Revolver, is only two years, less than two years after Hard Day's Night. Mm in summer of 64 and hard days night is the end of the personality expression phase when that album it's a great album but it is incredibly immature mm. with the subject matter you know it's it's very adolescent so within two years mm. as yeah. the uranus pluto conjunction was peaking their maturation from 64 to 66 in those two years is staggering it's epic mm. And uh, to me, it's the most incredible part of the story is the rapidity of their spiritual maturation, coinciding with the Uranus-Pluto conjunction yeah. and what was happening in their charts. But you can hear it on the music. It's yeah. a radical transformation that, that occurred there in, in a very short amount of time. Yeah, I took your advice and I listened through the albums as I you progressed through the, the charts of the you know, the charts and the analysis of each song. And because you, you know, you can go through that evolutionary ride in your book where you can sort of see how they mature their expression. And of course, I knew this because I've heard all the albums before, but I never saw it in this chronological order before. And it's sort of like, well, of course. And it reminded me also how this kind of naive, very youthful expression of the late 60s suddenly turned into this more kind of like, psychedelic a little bit more spiritual vibe quite quickly you know on the music scene as well you know so you could probably call Pluto Uranus uh, you know accelerated growth like now it's really happening it's happening quickly we're really discovering something here and yeah and also their choice of drugs changed during these period you know like <laughs> oh. everything and i lay that all out here's the a variety of different ways that we can see this acceleration this mm. shifting of consciousness that was so profound and rapid and then it influenced society and culture mm. um and the beatles being this famous and really at the forefront of our collective evolution they just represented it and their music is a soundtrack of, you know, spiritual maturation, you know, playing out, which is incredible. Mm. Yeah, it's, the, the thing is that they start out really, you know, as a quite a broken, <laughs> broken bunch of boys, you know, they had their really histories, they had history, like, both Paul and John lost their mothers quite early. And Ringo was ill for a lot of time when he was younger and you know they have this luggage especially Paul and and John that they keep carrying 
And I think uh, what I really enjoyed, because I'm such a big fan of series, um, the dwarf planet, that I think we should include more in astrology. <laughs> you know, it's time to take her seriously. And you, your book is like, uh, if you hadn't, if you haven't studied series at all, or if you kind of like don't know what it's about and you would love to know her, you would love to get to know her. Your book is a masterpiece of understanding when it comes to series. I was so thrilled to see that you, you give her such attention and you lay it in, you, you explain it so well, how it influences uh, the emotional history of, of the Beatles in particular. And she comes popping back in all the time, you know, Sarah's is, she's with. It was the greatest uh, surprise to me um, mm. how oh. focal Sarah's is. And to me, um, which is underplayed, mm. both astrologically and in our culture, we don't spend a lot of time talking about vulnerable mm. issues around attachment and, um, you know, just our early developmental experiences shaping so much of our psyche. Mm. And we like to pretend that we're beyond that and we're grown ups, and that stuff is mm. not so relevant anymore, but it is. And the Beatles story is you know, intimately connected to attachment issues. And so much of their early catalog is the longing for romantic attachment, almost as a surrogate or a substitute for the more core issues of emotional attachment. And then, you know, the greatest surprise of the book is they did have a reunion with sources of early developmental mm. attachment mm. and that became more realized in a spiritual way and so the greatest surprise here is that this is actually a spiritual love story um i had no idea that it would go in this direction mm. you know the beatles are famous for writing love songs right and all of that is a projection of a far deeper more sacred love that's motivating the whole thing, which has a lot to do with Sarah's and their mothers. And I had no idea that the book would turn into that, but that's what revealed itself overwhelmingly and irrefutably. And so I just, you know, followed where the astrology was going. Mm. And so I was like, wow, this is an unconventional love story. Yeah, well, um, I did some work previous to, to reading your book. I, I did a couple of webinars on Ceres Pleto, and, and I've been delving quite deep into that particular archetype myself for quite a few years now. And John, and, uh, uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono was part of that research material because it's such an important part of his history in particular. And, you know, the, the loss and the descent into the underworld and, you know, how how that kind of challenges um, our developmental processes, you know, like how, how can we, we have to move away from these, these wounds and these losses, but how do we do that? So, you know, I think um, since astrology today is definitely lacking a body of information when it comes to series and how we can apply it in astrology and how we can understand her. I think this book is a real resource when it comes to understanding the effect of series in a birth chart and shown very well through the themes that you uh, present in the book, because it's not just series, it's also this ongoing signature of Pluto opposing moon, Pluto conjunct moon, moon in scorpio like you see through the beatles the they got plenty of that moon stuff yeah, yeah. as well but i would also say that the other asteroids too play a role especially juno with yeah. its romantic focus um even athena to some degree uh investa as craftsmanship so the major asteroids do play a role but i would say that the other thing uh, as you probably saw in the book is i brought in the asteroid called uterp the muse and, and that's about inspiration and um, connecting, you know, um, at a spiritual level. Um, and really another major 
facet of the book really turned into this study about inspiration. What does that mean? Where do we get it from? Is there a spiritual component to inspiration? And um, and that really, as much as Ceres or the Uranus Pluto stuff that, or Neptune and Scorpio that you've mentioned, that really is the backbone of this book is what is inspiration. Mm-hmm. I believe that the book reveals that Beatles music and message was divinely inspired. And here's how we can understand that and see it astrologically. Mm-hmm. And it does open up a lot of important metaphysical questions. Um, as usual, <laughs> with, yeah. with, with evolutionary astrology, I would think that would be a natural consequence. This is what is life anyway, you know? Yeah, interesting. Right. What, yeah. is, the, what is the potential relationship between the dead and the living? Mm-hmm. There's not too many books out there that I know of that are this clear and revealing of a metaphysical relationship between the dead and the living and how can we understand that yeah because you have that mentioning you know if i just you know um eleanor rigby you know that sort of got me a little bit you know there was these incredible synchronicities between eleanor rigby the song and the actual (laughs) eleanor rigby she was just um she was buried not far away from Paul's mother. Was that it? You know, not far. <laughs> it's like, and he had no idea, of course, but he wrote the song. What was going on with Eleanor Rigby was at the peak in 1966 with Revolver and pretty much everything that occurred between 1965 to 67 even include some 68 too as on the white album there's a lot of woo woo stuff going on as well but pretty much (laughs) everything from rubber soul or even the help album in 65 to to the white album those that time frame Mm. is where the incredible metaphysical you know bridging of realms occurred um, and then the music before and after that is wonderful and bouncy and cool. And it's just not as connected in um, as the music when the Uranus Pluto conjunction was peaking mm. in the middle part of the decade, 65 to 67. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so not only Eleanor Rigby, but um, Sergeant Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour. Uh, the other songs on Revolver and Rubber Soul, Mm. you're looking at some really incredible things. I mean, I've been studying astrology for 23 years now. And I will say without any hesitation is uh, what was going on in my studies with those at that peak time is Mm. the most mind blowing astrology I've ever seen in my life. Mm. And so I spent a lot of time in the book on the transcendence phase with those albums Mm. Um, you know, Revolver and Sgt. Pepper are probably the two most um, incredible, um, Mm. you know, albums metaphysically. Although a lot on Magical Mystery Tour uh, was also pretty mind-blowing. Well, I must say, after reading about Sgt. Pepper and and going through the charts, etc. and so forth, I had to re-listen to it quite a few times and it gave me an entirely different... Kind of experience. Well, I'll just say for me personally, um, is that the Sgt. Pepper uh, piece for me was, uh, and I don't put anything personal into the book at all. I, I'm completely neutral and objective and I don't inject myself at all. But um, Sgt. Pepper for me uh, hooked into to something very personal. When I was a little kid, uh, when I first got into music, I'm talking four or five years old, Sgt. Pepper was my favorite album and I listened to it endlessly and I had no idea of the metaphysical dimensions, obviously, when I was a little kid. Mm. And so when I did the research and looked at all the astrology in midlife these last few years, for me, it was almost a sense of return and reunion with my own childhood 
and it helped me understand my own path because so much on Sgt. Pepper, as the book illustrates, points to astrology and metaphysics and geometric configurations in the sky and things that my soul incarnated on this planet to connect with. And I was like, oh my God, it was there the whole time. I just never saw it. You know, um, Mr. Kite or Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds mm-hmm. or A Day in the Life or a few other songs on that album are just so metaphysical. They're so astrological. And um, it was so fulfilling for me mm. uh, to discover what I did. Oh, can I just ask you a personal question about that? that time i mean did your parents did they dabble in esoterics or in any kind of metaphysical you know interests now my my parents are more um kind of civic minded activist liberal civil rights activists type political you know, they, um, political yeah they they were you know, active in the civil rights movement in the 60s. They both went to Antioch College. And uh, the reason why my my dad was interested in my mom, because she was arrested in a sit-in. So they really brought in much more of a liberal activist kind of do-gooder, you know, kind of mindset. But they really didn't, uh, you know, champion things that were more metaphysical or spiritual. I came to that independent of them. Mm. But they gave me, you know, that kind of background and, you know, they loved the Beatles and Bob Dylan and other things like that. And I mm. incarnated to a home that had plenty of records, you know, with music like that. Mm. Um, so they kind of gave me the Beatles. They didn't give me metaphysics. Mm, okay. But the Beatles were like the seed thought seeds that just entered into your subconscious and then sprouted so many years after as um, an epiphany or an insight or an understanding of something that is very, you know, uh, very close to your work and your life today, you know, the, where does, does, you know, when you sit for a reading or whatever, I mean, there is a, a co-creation with spirit all the time. I mean, there, there are these especially when you write as well, you probably notice that you go into this room of where it's like kind of like channeling, you're, you're in a room and the information is there. And especially researching in astrology is very magical experience because there's such a logic in it and it just evolves naturally and unfolds in a very... Well, magical. that's the, the major thing that happened is I was in a zone, a creative oh. vortex for a few years and when I completed the book, I got, I put it down and I needed some break from it. And when I go back now and I thumb through it, I have a whole different experience because I'm not in that zone anymore. I'm not in that creative process. And so I, when I look back at the book, I'm like, wow, I was just so immersed in it. Almost like the Beatles themselves were in the grips of their creative process when they Mm -hmm. did the music. I had that with the writing of it and I'm not in in it anymore. And when I look back on it or when I listen to the music now, I almost have a weird sensation um, where I'm in a different consciousness around it. Mm. Um, (laughs) And so it's- Sounds like an interesting experience. You know, like, what? Yeah, I kind of miss it. I, I, I had a magical relationship with this <laughs> uh, subject matter, and I'm no longer in the magic of it mm-hmm. as I was. Yeah. Um, I'm more re- released from it, and now I have to go on with my everyday life. So it was a really uh, magical time for me, mm. and that's why I was so private, and um, I wasn't that public you know, for a few years because I just wanted to be in that kind of in magical creative process. Yeah. That- and now I miss it. Yeah, of course. I want and, to move back and I kind of feel, <laughs> hmm. I kind of feel like it's a drag to deal with business and oh. more earthy things and promotion. Yeah. That's not really what I'm most interested in. I like the magic of the astrology yeah. and the metaphysics, 
but that's the way it is. You, you have to move on. And just like the Beatles, the dream is over and they have to you know, move on. And that's just the way it is. We have to learn to let it be yeah. and appreciate it. <laughs> basically. Yeah. Let it be. yeah. <laughs> but I'll never forget the process. And, and this book is a testament to that process. And, um, and it was special. It and was so, like a love relationship. Um, it's like it's. It, I mean, you notice when you read the book. It's like, oh, this is really coming from the heart. It's coming from. It's come. It's really. It's written with passion and and um, and wonder. There's this sense of wonder that comes through. It's like, oh wow, wow, look at this! Isn't it magical? All these synchronicities. At that point, when that song was written, and that point. Like it's just opening the celestial sky for us all to kind of like get familiarized with. And I normally say, you know, yeah, sure. It could be a coincidence if it happens once, but when there's a pattern, we no longer talk about anomalies. We talk about something that's repetitive. It's a constant rhythm in the universe. And that is a message. I think that to convey that to humanity today or to young people today, you know, uh, especially the where my heart goes, you know, that's why I'm so glad my son listened to the Beatles because they grow up in this disenchanted world where they are not educated about these connections, about this beautiful, you know, kind of, um, I want to say, the, the interwoven relationships that we have with the rhythm of our own solar system. It's like we live in it. We are it in a way. So that's um, well. What you said there about disenchantment is is really what the book is about: is that we live in an, in an enchanted universe. And part of the motivation of the book is to illustrate with tons of detail that there is this enchanted spiritual dimension that's operable throughout this whole entire story. And so, for the reader to conclude that, well, if it's there throughout everything I'm reading about them, of course, it's there for everything, including my life and everything that's happened in my biography, is part of my motivation is to support the re-enchantment mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. of the world, that everything is meaningful, everything's connected to another dimension, everything's connected to our soul mm. work and our processes, and we are not alone uh, we are connected in to these other levels or dimensions. And so that is part of the overarching motivation is, mm. is to any reader to see that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're bringing Muse, what do you call her? Usurp? Uh, the yeah. The, ash the asteroid Muse. Yeah. yeah. For any listeners who are confused by it, it's E-U-T-E-R-P-E. Yeah, and, uh, it's number you took. I tried to remember the asteroid number because you can actually plot it into asteroid ephemera. Yes, to get the position of it. Yes, you can. That's what I did. Is yeah. I plugged it in, and it became the start of the show. Um, the the muse, this whole idea, which anyone who reads Beatles literature, mm. uh, Julia Lennon and Mary McCartney are frequently discussed as mm. the muse mm. for their songwriting sons. But there hasn't been, to at least to my knowledge, an astrological analysis that shows you the relationship to the muse, um, mm. which again, brings these incredible metaphysical uh, implications. And mm. you know, to give away the point of the book is that this was the sole contract was to have a collaboration specifically around writing uh, through the veil. Mm. And that's what they did. It was all orchestrated. It was all intentional. And so one of the subtexts of the book is also to understand that the things that we consider most tragic might actually be connected to layers of meaning and even soul intentions that we have no idea about. And so part of the invitation of the book you know, is to trust life, is to see that there's things going on that the personality is just simply not aware of, and events are actually conspiring to support us mm. 
mm. rather than the personality that might see things as negative or tragic or things of that variety. Mm. But life is a lot more benevolent than our stories are. Yeah. Well, and what we normally say in evolutionary astrology as well is what pleases the soul doesn't necessarily please the persona. You know, it can be uncomfortable to go through these things and, and, um, yeah, but you, 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 you invite the reader very gently there, you know, people, um, astrology in itself is, is um, adding a dimension of meaning to everything. You know, astrologers, we translate, right? So we add meaningfulness to also what normally could be considered completely meaningless because they're so painful events, you know? So, I mean, healing loss is never easy and, um, it takes time, but this offers but, a good window yeah. to kind of like, whoops, you know, get into a little lighter atmosphere around it all. Yeah. And, and with the book is, you know, one of the major, you know, threads in there is that we can transmute emotional processes into creative expression for mm. catharsis and release and to give a gift from the very um, issues of our wounds is what they did. Um, Beatles music was kind of a form of musical group therapy for them. <laughs> yeah. mm. They all had these early developmental serous wounds or moon mm. issues and they're human. Most of us, myself included, all of us, you know, have similar types of things. So what the, the beauty of their contribution is, Hey, we're all in this together. We're all mm. part of, you know, life, well, let's all be together in the yellow submarine, <laughs> yeah. you know, sailing to realization, sailing yeah. to the sun of spiritual, and, and just, you know, with a little help from my friends, my friends the same yeah, idea just thinking about it. is that mm. it, the whole thing about the Beatles is togetherness. Like, mm. you know, let's just be human and, you know, open and connected and, and embrace the goodness of life um, together. Um, we can heal our wounds of separation. We can heal our grief. We can heal um, these things and um, and have joy. And yeah. so really the Beatles are about the reclamation of joy and trust in life and good cheer after we can heal tragedy. Yeah. And I think it's a beautiful message and it's inspiring. And their example, in my view, of actually connecting, you know, with um, those beyond the veil, we don't really lose anyone. Mm. And so it provides a metaphysical perspective on death. And one of the big surprises of the book is the Beatles are such an upbeat, you know, infectious musical kind of group. But as the book illustrates, I think there's 30 songs that are in the death thread. I mean, the mm. Beatles had a lot of focus on death mm. and there's a lot of death in the Beatles story. And so much Uranus Pluto is a mm. metaphysical perspective, Uranus on death. Mm. So this was something I wasn't expecting to see, <laughs> but you know, death is one of the major threads of the book and the transformation of our understanding and experience of death mm. is, is, is in there. Yeah. That reminds me, you know, my head is on fire because I'm thinking of all this Ceres, Plato, moon stuff. And it reminds me of, um, um, you know, the Eleusinian rites, you know, these mystery rites that they used to have for the goddess Demeter before she morphed into Ceres. And these rites, they were, um, they don't know much about it because there were secret rites, but the initiate, he had to kind of like walk, you know, the ascension, you know, the descension into the underworld and then the ascending part again, um, as part of an initiatory uh, healing of fear in life. Like the initiate couldn't have this fear of death in order to, uh, uh, because it prevented the initiate from living life to its fullest. So they had these death rites uh, under the cult of Demeter, and they did this kikion, not completely, you know, uh, proved that they did, but most likely they did these psychotropic substances that kind of like 
thinned the whale so that they could see through to the other side. And I must admit, it's quite a funny synchronicity that we are now at the new moon, the new moon in Scorpio as we're speaking, you know, and we just, you know, we're entering into the zone where, you know, death is a large part of our um, um, what we have to also accept with life, right? So, so they, they went through these initiations uh, with this uh, series in the Demeter cult just so that they could embrace life more fully. Isn't that exactly what you said there? Just in other words, <laughs> you know, our Well, you mentioned uh, <laughs> alter states of consciousness. And yeah, that is a theme of the book. They were famously, you know, indulging in those things. But I would say that dreams. Mm. Um, yeah, you have a dream. Is even too. more, mm. more central in this book is the reunion that they experienced occurred in dream time. And the dream thread is the most populous thread of all of the 10 threads that I discuss in the book. Um, there's more dream songs than any other thread. And, um, and so the way that I, I frame that is through um, altered states of consciousness, you know, basically their drug use, but dreams, but also meditation and contemplative oh, practice. Yeah. Um, this all is part of the dream thread. And this is where the channels of inspiration opened up. And so much of their contribution, as I illustrate in the book, is about raising consciousness to be receptive from other dimensions or the muse or our soul processes. And to me, Beatles music especially in that transcendence period in the middle mm. is divinely inspired, um, which is pretty remarkable. And the book illustrates how you can see that mm. and to contrast it with, with the music at the beginning and at the end of their career, which isn't in my mm. view, divinely inspired. Um, and so it's fascinating to track that, with that trajectory of the arc of awakening that we spoke about, which rises and falls mm -hmm. is that we rise up to be able to connect with other dimensions and we come back down, we bring it down and we have to exist on our own two feet. And that's what they did at the end of the career with the individuation period mm -hmm. and then their solo careers. Mm -hmm. And so this is why people say that, Oh, you know, the solo works are fine. They're great. They're um, there's great music that all four of them did with their solo careers, hmm. but very rarely does anyone speak of any of their solo works as having the same inspired magic as the middle period of the Beatles, um, roughly again, 65 to 68 or so. Um, they just had an, uh, an opening, uh, the, the window was open during that time. And it's not a window that opens very frequently hmm. and, they, and they seized it. Yeah, and, and George Harrison was interesting in that sense because he sort of, you know, being a Pisces with the 12th house moon, he was very sensitive to, you know, could we say the collective vibration. He went to, at the peak of his career in many ways, he went to study uh, guitar or sitar with Ravi Shankar, right? You know, like, which was yeah. completely not a thing to do for a pop star, but, you know, that's what he did. And he brought that vibe into the music again, you know, at that particular, in that particular period. Well, Harrison's contribution, um, musically you're speaking about, yes, mm. not only with the sitar, with the guitar and with other instruments and songwriting, absolutely. But I would say that Harrison's major contribution um, is, philosophically is more, he was the most coherent around spiritual philosophy and understanding. He was the most intellectually and, and philosophically mature and studied Eastern religion. And, um, and what his uh, contribution really was, was honing their philosophical message. And, on Sergeant Pepper, his song, Within You, Without You, as the 
book illustrates astrologically, that song lines up more than any as their message. You mm. read the lyrics mm. to that song, mm -hmm. George is delivering the mature message of the Beatles. And then he took it further as well. Um, and there are several other songs that he wrote that are very indicative of their philosophical message. Whereas George, I'm sorry, John and Paul are mainly doing the inspired channeling from their dead mothers and putting mm, you know, things into the message, into the music. Uh, George, George brought in more of the philosophy. He was more of the teacher of the group. Yeah, but John, I think, you know, he went on later on to seek a lot of deeper meaning with life, etc. and so forth, you know, uh, as he individualized away from, from the Beatles, you know, I, you know, I sure. think. But yeah, but John's, John's focus has always been as the Libra is about cultural change. Mm. It's about mm revolution of culture and society and consciousness. The thing about Lenin that I remark on in the book is that he was the trendsetter. He had the most impact on cultural, social trends. Everything from twist and shout, which changed culture, to even give peace a chance, changing culture in society. Mm, yeah. um, so much, so much of, of what Lenin did um, was about that. Um, whereas George was more, um, here's a philosophy. Uh, yeah. More than a um, but John was the cultural trendsetter. I mean, he's created the Beatles himself. You know, he was the leader. He was the, in the early phases, he was by far the most um, assertive and leadership and uh, prolific as a writer and and he got them going he created the legend mm -hmm. and his um his songs in the early phases i think were the most emblematic the most iconic um and then part of his work he was learning to yield he was learning to be more diplomatic and then so much of the book is about Paul in the latter part of the story mm -hmm. becoming the more dominant and influential songwriter is what happened. And then Paul um, learned from John how to do that. And Paul's contributions at the end, particularly Let It Be, Hey Jude, had big cultural impact. And Paul learned that. And John learned to be more supportive. And mm. so the whole Lennon McCartney thing mm. um, is they were learning from each other. One of my favorite lines in the book is John was a visionary learning how to be a performer. And Paul was a performer learning how to be a visionary. Mm. Yeah. And so they modeled how to do that for each other. Mm. I was just thinking about something that John said about Yoko. That uh, when you said that about you know being looking for a teacher or looking for spiritual enlightenment or looking for understanding, like there was this, like he really, in one way, was looking for understanding, and he said that Yoko is my teacher, and that's a you know it's not completely exactly what he said, but he considered her uh, his teacher. So evidently, he was kind of looking for a spiritual connection with life in one way or another and i think you know at least that's how i've been connecting with john especially through some of his solo albums because i i heard them a lot growing up and they woke up something in me that i found was incredibly spiritual in many ways you know like that like imagine it's a you know <laughs> it's a song about having a positive vision about the world in general and um sure hmm. yeah all right well i, I want to back up for a sec though yeah i want to mention one other thing um that i forgot to mention about harrison mm -hmm. and where you can mm -hmm. find his contribution is a relatively obscure song called the inner light which was a single in early 1968 it's the b-side to lady madonna um 
but the inner light is based on the teachings from the Tao Te Ching that Harrison repackages into a song format. And so here he is blatantly, you know, being heavily influenced by spiritual text mm. going into mm. Beatles music. Um, and so anyone can Google the lyrics to the inner light or within you, without you. These are two prime examples of Harrison's uh, philosophical focus within Beatles music. And there's a couple other examples too. Um, but I was remiss in mentioning that. So I just wanted to back up for that one. Good. No, I, I, and that made me wonder about one thing as well. I mean, because I never paid a lot of attention to his solo career, but did he continue this uh, particular philosophical, spiritual journey throughout his music? Or when the Beatles, you know, when the peak came down, did something happen to his kind of spiritual? Well, I mean, Harrison's most famous solo song is My Sweet Lord. Yeah, I yeah, know. Which is, you know, <laughs> all about the continuation of that. Um, you know, Harrison's solo career post Beatles um, does have a lot of the continuation mm. um, of what he started, but he also individuated and did plenty of other things mm. and um, that were not so overtly spiritual. Um, you know, he diversified like they all did. Mm. Uh, he didn't want to be pigeonholed as the spiritual Beatle. I mean, he did plenty of other things too. Mm. You know, Harrison was active with plenty of, you know, he was involved with the Monty Python, you know, comedy troupe and, and oh. making film with them. And he did plenty of other things. He was, you know, he was, uh, had a lot of variety with his interests. Huh. Interesting. Well, I was quite surprised when my son came out and he, <laughs> he showed me my sweet Lord and I'm like, now we're talking. <laughs> because you know like i was thoroughly happy to see a but i i do want to mention though that the book ends when the beatles break up so their solo careers are not part of this book but anything that they yeah. did that was prior to the breakup that is addressed in the book some mm. solo stuff um but not the stuff after 1970 none of that is in the book mm. I just thought I'd ask since you, you were here and you're evidently a little bit further into the material than I am. So, yeah, well, that's interesting. Thank you uh, for sharing all that with me, Eric. Um, I would also like to mention that this book is available for purchase on Amazon. I found it, you know, the Amazon.com. You have uh, your own profile there. I will, I will link for where people can get this book. You know, yeah, you know. well, um, to keep in mind, just across the board, whoever you buy the book from is going to get the money for it. So if you want to support Jeff ah. Bezos, then buy it from him. If you want to support me as the then, creator, then you can buy it from me. Oh, great um, point, man. Then I'm just going to get the link to you and then they can buy the book directly from you, right? They do can buy it from me. Do you ship it? Well, that's the thing is that, you know, the thing that really is a challenge is that I'm in America and to send it to American addresses is very inexpensive through media mail. Uh, unfortunately, these days, sending this book overseas is incredibly expensive. It's more expensive than the book, mm. but what can I do about it? So um, because it is a heavy book, it's two and a half pounds because it's, it's yeah. 500 pages. Yeah. And so the shipping is quite expensive. There's nothing I can do about this. Yeah, it's suddenly shipping got so super expensive, especially internationally. So, yeah, okay, yeah, so ridiculous. we have that. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we have the same problem. It doesn't, you know, I buy directly from people in Australia and I'm happy to pay the extra money because I want the thing, you know, like, and it's not, you know, most of us won't be bankrupted by that extra <laughs> fee, but it's still very annoying. You know, why couldn't... <laughs> why couldn't it's... It's, it's ridiculous, actually. Yeah, yeah but it's but, a good point. Uh, that's a different, it's a different topic. Mm. Yeah, it is, actually, yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Um, I would also say one more thing about the book is that it's a great astrological study for a beginner of astrology. It is absolutely epic when it comes to looking at charts, you know, just getting into it because there's a, a large quantity of charts and people, you can train your brain to read charts while, while reading it. You get good explanation there's good crossover sections between the text where you explain stuff and then you can go back and look at the visuals so i think for a for a student on a beginner's level it's absolutely accessible material as well and it's actually quite uh, it's a good read in that sense because it's practice 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 in reading charts so um that's one of the things that i found also to be um well, thank you for saying that. yeah you know, aspect of the book that's one of the things I wanted to do is, you know, to invite the everyday reader uh, who may not have a background in astrology to, um, to see how astrology uh, can play out with mm. a well-known example. And so if people um, want to be more immersed in it and, um, you know, I have found that people without any astrological background, my sense is at this early stage it's a bit much for people. It's an, it's a lot of info and, you know, but people with some background in astrology and yeah. some basics, um, they're going to appreciate and learn a mm. lot. Oh yeah. You know, and it's fun. The other thing about, about this is, you know, I had a blast writing it and I encourage the reader to read the lyrics and listen to the music as you make your way through, see all the astrology. And there's this whole other dimension that emerges and it's fun mm. and you know to see it and to listen to it on the music you know uh so um so i'm glad that you've mentioned that it is a tool for learning yeah the another thing that came up while reading it was that i constantly got these associations to richard tarnas you know this being such a historical document as well, you know, like it's such a, I mean, he, he goes into the wide perspective of so many decades and so many centuries, et cetera, and so forth. You zoom in on one particular time period, but it still kind of like gives the same historical value in terms of astrological studies, you know, like it's, it's um, zooming nicely in on a very important and still unfolding phase, if I may say so, you know, we're still in that cycle, you know, so. Yeah, that's what I re remark on is that mm. the Uranus-Pluto conjunction in the 60s, you know, we don't have another Uranus-Pluto conjunction until the early years of the next century. Ooh. We're talking 2100, mm. you know, we're talking 80 <laughs> years from now. And so what was begun there was a cycle for about 130 mm. years. Mm. And we're only, you know, just had the square, as you mentioned recently. So we have a long way to go the rest of this century. Mm. So what was seated at that time is actually what is relevant for the rest of our century. And mm. then we're going to have another big, well, none of us will be alive, um, <laughs> maybe in a different <laughs> lifetime, but we're not going to be alive for the next conjunction. Ugh, it's so depressing to think about them. It's like, I want to be alive. I love being alive. Well, we are, you know, alive for the current one. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you and I would be about 130 years old at the next Uranus Pluto conjunction, and that's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, anyways, we might be alive on the other side, you know, so that's when we can start being yeah. muses. Um, quite interesting, uh, the asteroid muse, because you do this uh, composite chart, so you do that, you have the chart of the Beatles as the central piece for the whole, um, for the whole book, and um, it makes a lot of sense, this chart, of course, but I, I, I saw that the asteroid news was on 14 degrees Aquarius. And I thought, yay, I live there. This is my sun, uh, sun degree. And uh, I know it's fairly active place in your chart as well without giving off too much information. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. And that was, um, again, the greatest uh, surprise and development of the book. I went in without any agenda no about where I might go. I just, yeah. I just said, the way it started was, 
I just had an epiphany in late 2016. I was writing another book and I was using for that other book, uh, McCartney as an example for some chart thing in that book. And then I had the epiphany of, I think I need to write a whole book just on the, on the astrology of the Beatles. <laughs> and so I said, okay. So when I went into it, I'm like, I'm going to do it. And I'm just going to have beginner's mind, which means mm. I'm not going to have any idea where it's going to go. I'm going to bring a fresh perspective and see what the astrology takes me into. And then that was the focus was the muse and this whole idea um, of collaboration between worlds. Um, and then the thing about it is I didn't discover that initially. I wrote most of the book without running into that, without mm -hmm. even using that asteroid um, because I don't use it in my regular practice. Yeah. Um, so I wrote most of the book without that. And then when I was actually doing rewriting, um, I came across on the internet, I was like, let me research inspiration. How is that found astrologically? And I ran into the understanding of the muses. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll look at the muses. Oh, there's one specifically about music. Huh, let's see how that shows up in Beatles astrology. And then when I researched it, especially what was happening in 1965, and what I call the big Gemini eclipse in May of 1965 for the song Yesterday, that's when it became overwhelming. Oh my God, the muse is so incredibly tied in to Mary McCartney, Paul, this eclipse, the, um, the downloading of yesterday, which is what McCartney says. And he retells the story over and over and over. And he says, he actually says in numerous interviews, I did not write this song. It came to me. He goes, it was a gift. In fact, one of my opening quotes in the book is him saying that is what opens the entire book is where M McCartney says that I dreamed the song yesterday. It came to me. I'm not the author of it. Somebody else is. And so all the astrology shows you who the author is. And it's so fantastic and clear mm. and irrefutable what was going on when you bring in that signature is that that became the clincher. That in and what happened, and that was at the peak time in 1965. That's when things were most, um, you know, jamming with this multi dimensional understanding. And so it just wrote itself after that discovery. As usual, life just keeps creating itself all the time. <laughs> all we have to do is lean back and just let it create. And But that is beautiful, you know, it's so touching. And it also reminds me of how I felt so many times while I read it. It's like, oh, this is really touching. And I really touched and it's really, it was touching. Because maybe, as you say as well, or not maybe, but because what you say there is so deep into, woven into the fabric of being human. Like, I think a lot of us wants to know if, are we alone? Is there something happening after death? Yeah. Where are we? You know, like this, this existential fright. This whole thing about death and our soul work. And really, to be honest with you, what made me complete the book was a sense of responsibility to yeah. Mary McCartney and Julia Lennon because their story has never been told. Their contribution to this music is largely unknown. And that was what I discovered. And I felt a sense of responsibility to them. And I dedicated the book to them. And they turned out to be obviously so hugely central and important to the whole story. Um, is that I became uh, moved mm, yeah, yeah, by yeah. their example and what they actually took on at a soul level is epically beautiful in mm. my view. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. it is heavily stirring and emotional mm. of what they took on, what they did, the way that they loved their sons unconditionally and supported them is the most moving part of this. Mm. and this transformation of death 
into something beautiful and meaningful mm. and having this metaphysical reunion that was able to create this incredible music mm. is just so moving to me. And mm. I really felt a sense of allegiance and responsibility to these two women who their contribution is not understood. Well, 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 if that wasn't a big, big love to mamas of the world, then I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Being a mother myself is very nice to hear you say that. So thank you, Eric, a lot. And I, I will make sure to, to give your people the contact info. I'm uh, extremely, well, moved <laughs> again. It's, it's, so, yeah. So I hope that Beatles will keep on enchanting us for many, many generations. And seeing my son, I think there's good hope that yeah. they might. You know, like Because it does. It touches in with something magical and something um, beautiful yeah. and something very emotional. Yeah. And it's my prayer that I've given justice to that with the writing of it. Well, I must say it makes me extremely happy when I hear his alarm bell go off in the morning and it is... Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Good choice, son. All right. Well, well, well. Maybe we'll see you later here on Solstice Up. That would have been amazing. So I Yes, well, thank you so much for having me and having this dialogue. And I always love the opportunity to to share it and to speak about it. So yeah. thank you for your support and your friendship. Well, the nada. Ciao, ciao.